it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Delancey to mm -hmm. you. He, um, he is, I'll read the bio, he is a oh. Norman F. Fuller Professor of Gynecology and a Professor of Urology at the University of Michigan. He's a native of Ann Arbor and is a graduate of Oberlin College mm -hmm. at the University of Michigan Medical School. Dr. Delancey was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2012 for pioneering work in advancing imaging and biomechanics that has elucidated the basic mechanisms of pelvic floor disorders. His interdisciplinary research with biomechanical engineer James Ashton Miller and nurse researcher Janice Miller has received over 20 million in NIH funding over 20 years. He has been a keynote speaker in over 30 countries on five continents and has published over 230 scientific papers. So Dr. Delancey has been president of the American Urogynecological Society and the Society of Gynecological Surgeons, having received the Distinguished Surgeons Award from the latter group. He has an active surgical practice for complex and refractory pelvic floor problems and has been listed in the Who's Who in Medicine and Best Doctors in America. So I think we're very lucky yeah. to have you here this morning, <laughs> this afternoon. Thank yeah. you so much for coming. Well, thanks, and, Jen. Um, I'll hand over to you then. Great. Thanks, Jenny. It's a real pleasure to be able to be here with you this morning. And a lot of what Jen was talking about is, are, are things that really has been, have come out of a collaboration uh, at Michigan between engineers and gynecologists. James and I met, we think it was probably 1991 or 1992. We're having a hard time figuring out exactly what that was. And James Ashton Miller is a biomechanical engineer whose father was a urologist who tried to understand bladder control problems, and all of my family are engineers. Uh, and so James and I found this area that we were both passionate about trying to understand that had to do with the pelvic floor. And so a lot of what I'm going to share from you is really about a dialogue that's been going on between uh, James and those people with a background in engineering asking very precise questions that none of us ever thought about. And on the other hand, us talking about broad phenomena and things that engineering had never thought about. And so there's this shared space that we have that is, why is it that women uh, who have given birth have so many problems later on in life with the pelvic floor? And what could we learn about that that would help us to be able to better understand what's going on? And when you think for a moment about the structural mechanics of the idea of vaginal birth, and if you look at the size of the fetus and the size of the opening, you realize that from a structural mechanics problem, it's a real challenge. And this is something that actually uh, is been the basis of a lot of our understanding is trying to be able to understand what it is that's going on. Um, this is the group at Michigan that's interested in, in pelvic floor disorders. And as you can see from the list in the bottom, we come from many different disciplines. And part of what I think we found so useful is the dialogue that goes on between different people of different background, asking the kinds of questions that the other discipline would never even think about asking. And most of the time, we say, gee, that's very interesting. We've never thought about that before. <coughs> Um, so James is the senior uh, engineer in the group, and uh, Lu Yan Chen has been working with us, who's now a postdoc, and then Xia Xia Liu and uh, Guo Chen uh, are two other uh, students, PhD students, who've done dissertations with us, and I'll be mentioning some of their work as we go along. This is actually a true story. Um, uh, if you think about this, I think it happened in 2001, and there are two people that are involved. Uh, one is me, and the other was Brian Mooney, who was a master's candidate in engineering. Uh, and I'll just let you read the dialogue. Biomechanically, birth is impossible. 
there's nothing in the literature that would allow you to be able to predict how a seven and a half pound baby, a 3,200 gram infant, can be delivered through an opening that's smaller than your mouth and not have universal damage. So that's been the biggest challenge for us, is actually to try and understand what it is from a biomechanics standpoint that allows human birth to happen. Because it is something that at the face of it is impossible. And so there were a lot of, a lot of things that we had to think about to try and come to grips with how we were going to address this problem. And the why is it important, I think, is something that needs some emphasis because um, it's not a problem that people talk about the problems that happen as a result of birth. It's not something that people say, oh, my knee is bothering me, or oh, I had a ruptured disc that was operated on. Uh, this is a woodcut from the 1550s, uh, and vaginal birth really hasn't changed much since that time. Now, this actually happens to be somebody trying to push a prolapse back up into place, and most of what I'm going to talk about today is about the prolapse that happens of the vagina and the uterus, because it's very common and it is by far the, the most strongly associated with birth. Uh, it is when the vagina turns completely inside out, and so that you see the, the uterine cervix here, and then the walls of the vagina are completely outside the body. Now, you can understand why somebody wouldn't mention that this has happened to her. It's not the kind of thing that our societies accept in normal conversation, but it's tremendously common and requires a lot of surgical gymnastics in order to try and correct it. Now, if we knew that 10% of 3 million healthy young women were being injured so severely that they required surgery, a national campaign would be launched to stop these injuries, right? I mean, that's a lot of people, a lot of healthy young women. So we do know that. 10% or about that of women having vaginal delivery have an injury to their pelvic floor that leads them to need surgery later on in life. So the reason that we haven't had a national campaign is that it tends to be something that occurs outside of public view. Births aren't something that everybody watches. And the problems that women have are not the kinds of things that people talk about, but it is a major public health problem. And so that's what our group has been doing, is trying to come to grips with some of the problems that have to do with pelvic floor disorders. Now to just give you a visual in the United States of about how many women have a bad enough pelvic floor disorder that they need to have surgery per year, and it's about 330,000 operations. I brought pictures of our football stadium. Uh, the football stadium holds 110,000 people. And so if you think that you fill that football stadium three times, and if every single person who's in that football stadium had a sudden injury, everybody would be rushing around and trying to figure out some way for us to be able to deal with that. And it's because it is this hidden epidemic that it's something that I think requires us to actually say this is a problem that we should look at. Now when I say the word pelvic floor disorders, I'm referring to several different things. One is pelvic organ prolapse, which I've talked with you about already, which is the most birth associated. One is urinary incontinence that most people have heard about now, which affects somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of women as they get older. And then fecal incontinence, which is the least common but the most devastating of the pelvic floor disorders. There's a fair amount of sexual dysfunction that can be associated with that, and this is now being referred to as the fourth uh, pelvic floor disorder, but the, the top three are the main ones that when people refer to pelvic floor disorders. The consequences of these is that there is a certain amount of social isolation and ostracism that happens. There's a loss of independence as people, especially with incontinence, get older and don't go out because there's not a toilet when they're going to go, and so they're apprehensive about being away from that. And then oftentimes, because of problems with prolapse or incontinence, people stop exercising and stop pursuing the healthy lifestyle that they would normally have been able to enjoy. So we know a lot about injury, don't we? Uh, and I'm sure that there are people in the Bioengineering Institute that are working on injury problems that have to do with knees or backs or, uh, or other things. And we know that the first thing is to find out what's wrong. Once you know what's wrong, you'll have a treatment that's designed to be specific to that problem. In some instances, you'll try and do some rehabilitation, but most importantly, people will be looking to try and prevent those kinds of problems from happening. So if you look at comparing birth injury rates with athletic injury rates, 
that you can see that actually vaginal birth is a far more risky endeavor than playing what we call soccer in the States, which is what you would call football, gymnastics, field hockey, or basketball. It's actually per hour of exposure to injury one of the most risky t uh, times during an individual's life. Now to, to kind of talk to you about why I'm going to be talking mainly about prolapse, when we look at the number of operations that are required per year, it's about 10,000 for fecal incontinence. Uh, for stress urinary incontinence, which is the surgically a manageable kind of incontinence, it's about 120,000. And with pelvic organ prolapse, it's about 200,000 operations in the United States. So it's approximately one in 10 women that need to have some kind of repair surgery that has to do with the injuries that they've sustained during, during vaginal birth. It's the same number of operations as are done for breast cancer. It's actually twice as many operations as are done for prostate cancer, diseases that are much more widely accepted as an area for contemporary research. So it is something that I think does get into what I would think about as public health issues where not only are we thinking about treatment, but since vaginal delivery is the biggest opportunity for us to do prevention, since it already happens in hospitals where people are in under medical care, it's really a great opportunity if only we knew what was wrong, what happened during vaginal birth. Because until we know what it is that happens during vaginal birth, it's kind of hard to design a prevention strategy. So the top photograph is a photograph just before the birth of a normal term infant. And the bottom picture is a photograph of somebody 20 to 30 years later, once age and the other factors of have happened so that prolapse develops. Women have their children in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s. They have prolapses in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So the key issue is to think about the, this as a latent injury. We know that it happens during vaginal birth. We know that it lays dormant, but it leads to prolapse later on in life. So that was the initial problem that we had to solve is what was it? And everybody had their ideas. There was a group that thought that it was nerve injury. Lots of people thought that. There were a lot of people who thought that it was muscle compression, that there was just too much pressure between the head and the pelvic bones. There are people who thought that it was a muscle rupture. And there were people who thought that it was connective tissue rupture. And obviously, if you're going to try and prevent something, you need to know what's wrong. Because if you're designing a prevention strategy, and it's actually not what's causing the injury, you can spend a lot of time and effort that really doesn't benefit anyone. So this is a smaller prolapse here. Uh, the vagina is prolapsing out through the opening of the vagina. And part of what happened was that all of a sudden MRI became available. And before, yeah, if we can just turn the lights down for a second. So that's one possibility. Okay. So what you can see, this is the urine in the bladder here. And you can see that that comes way down outside of the body here. And the uterus, which is right here behind, goes down. In the old days, this is what everybody saw. And so you can imagine that people had a very limited set of observations. Now with the advent of MRI, we can do a lot more quantification. And if we can go ahead and have the lights back on, please. So at its simplest mechanical uh, uh, form, what we have is if this is the vagina that's inside a pressurized chamber, that it's kind of like if you think about a, a rubber surgical glove, and if one of the fingers is, is not popped out like the rest of them, you can squeeze the air in the glove and that'll pop that finger out. And that's actually what the basics of the phenomenon of prolapse are, that you compress an isobaric chamber, and if there's a flexible invagination, that will then prolapse downwards. So if the, uh, if the student design project was to design a system that would prevent that from happening, there are two different things that most people would think about. One is they'd think about connecting that invaginated portion with some ligaments or cables or something. The other is that they'd close the bottom so that there wasn't any place for things to prolapse. And that's actually what evolution in the pelvic floor has done over the course of time. And I'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail now. So if we look at the pelvis from the side, there's the pubic bone over here, 
the bladder is behind that, the uterus is here, and then the vagina is right there. The rectum is in the back. And as I'll show you in a minute, there are a series of muscles, the levator ani muscles, that actually squeeze all of these organs closed. That was the little red thing closing the bottom of the, uh, of the invaginated area that I showed you in the last diagram. So if we diagrammatically have the bladder in the front, and then the uterus, the vagina, and then the rectum, uh, there are two ligaments which are not ligaments, um, which are actually the, the vascular supply of the uterus, but clinicians refer to them as ligaments. So I'll start out by saying, don't be fooled by the word ligaments. They're not ligaments, they're mesenteries. Um, but they attach to the uterus and the upper vagina to be able to kind of steady things in place. Those are the, those are the tension-based cable elements. Um, and then there is this sling of muscle that wraps from one side of the body around behind the rectum goes up to attach to the pubic bone that are called the levator ani muscles because they elevate the anus. I mean, if you take a second and just tighten the muscles in your pelvic floor to try and lift your bottom off of the seat, that's what the pelvic floor muscles do. And that's going to be a major focus of my talk today because those are the structures that are injured during vaginal birth. And then, of course, um, you need to have some kind of control system up here. And if we can turn these front lights off, please. Um, so you need to have a brain and a spinal cord. Then you need to have motor nerves that go down. Then you need to have afferent nerves that go back up. And it's a very, very, very sophisticated system. If you speak a sentence that contains consonants, every time you say a consonant, you stop the flow of air. And every time you stop the flow of air, your intra-abdominal pressure goes up slightly and the levator ani muscles tense slightly. It's that highly equilibrated of a system. It has a lot of control to it, even though I think most of the time we ignore a lot of the central controls. But just to assure you that that's there and important. There's also, we said, a container. And so there is a medium inside the container. And then that's going to exist in an overall environment, which is atmospheric pressure. Now, if you then compress that, if you just take a deep breath and go and strain down, abdominal pressure goes up. And if abdominal pressure goes up, it's going to push down on everything and tend to make everything prolapse downwards. So in a normal situation where everything's aligned properly and working right, the levator ani muscles actually hold the opening of the vagina closed. So if that is closed, then there's not any pressure differential. It's called the hiatus in medical terminology, and it's that closure of the hiatus that is key to, to a lot of the mechanics that I'll talk about. So increases in pressure then result in an equal amount of change in both the uh, bladder and the rectum so that we know that the pressure rises are the same. So those two pressures essentially result in no net force being generated because they're equal in magnitude. Now, if you want to see that, this is an MRI of a normal woman who's performing a Valsalva maneuver. And, okay, there we go. She's still performing a Valsalva maneuver. And if you look right in this area, you can th see how things kind of get compressed against themselves. You see that the structures on the front and the structures on the back are both moving together and things, things get closed. And that's, um, that's an essential part of, uh, of the alignment imperative. Things have to be aligned right for these mechanics to work properly. Now, the levator can be damaged at vaginal birth. It happens in about, you know, between 1 in 10 and 1 in 15 births. And if the muscle is damaged, then the hiatus comes open. And if the hiatus comes open, then you have increases in intra-abdominal pressure that are really not adequately balanced. And if you have a high pressure on one area and a lower pressure on another, then you'll get a force that's generated on the membrane that exists between those two different domains. And as you start to have those develop, once there's a pressure differential that's created, the walls of the vagina move downwards. 
So here you can see the bladder. You can see that the bladder is coming all the way down below where the muscles are. And that fundamentally changes the structural mechanics once things become misaligned like this. So that you no longer have the front wall of the vagina and the back wall of the vagina in opposition. Because what happens in that instance is now we have a part of the vagina that's exposed to this pressure differential. And as you expose that to a pressure differential, that's going to pull on the vaginal wall. And that's going to pull on the ligaments, creating a tension force that then has to be resisted by the attachment of the ligaments to the, uh, to the surrounding bony pelvis. So this is basically the simple mechanism that I'm going to be talking about as we talk about things. And you can see how central the idea that if the muscle is damaged and can't hold things in proper alignment, then over the course of 20 years with repetitive loading, all of a sudden uh, Davis's law will come into play and soft tissue will accommodate to the stresses that are placed on it. Wolf's law is for bony tissues. You subject bony tissues to forces. It will remodel. Connective tissue is the same way. So this is a woman contracting her pelvic floor muscles just to demonstrate to you how you can see the way that those muscles lift the organs that are in place. And that's what it is that the levator muscles do in a normal situation is that normally we're not all contracting them actively all the time, but the resting tone in the muscles is responsible for holding things in a normal position. Now, there's not going to be an exam at the end of the lecture on naming all the different parts of the levator ani muscles, but what I would like you to notice is the sling-like nature of these muscles. They start up here on the insides of the pubic bone and on this fibrous band along here, and they go around to insert into the structures. This is the anus back here. This is the opening of the vagina here. This is the urethra up here in the front. This is the arch of the pubic bone. So the woman's lying down in this posture as if they were going to have a pelvic examination or give birth. And so it's the lifting effect of these slings of muscles that's the critical function of the levator ani. This is not like other skeletal muscles that attach to two bony points. There's no limit to the lengthening that happens. Your elbow, your biceps muscle, only has a certain amount of lengthening it can, can do before your um, elbow joint reaches its maximum extent and at that point the muscle is protected from stress injury. All of the different skeletal muscles have that kind of protective mechanism but the levator ani muscles don't. So they're subjected to orders of magnitude of lengthening that are far outside what normally is seen. And so if you just think about this as a group of muscles that kind of attach to structures here or sling around behind, that's the basic concept that we're going to be looking at. Now this is an MRI of a woman and you can see, this is cut across the body and you can see the urethra here and you can see the urethra is this little bullseye here. And this is the vagina right behind it with the rectum in the back. And then over here you can see the levator ani muscle that I've outlined. And you see that it's just to the side of where the urethra and the vagina are. And so that's this part of, let me just find my mouse again, this part of the levator muscles that are right beside the urethra and the vagina. Now is the body bilaterally symmetric? Is her body bilaterally symmetric? You see the attachment of the muscle there? nothing on the other side. So she had an avulsion of her levator ani muscle at the time of a vaginal birth. It happened to only be damaged on one side, it's not damaged on both, so it makes it a way that you can actually look and compare what things normally should look like to what things look like when they're abnormal. And that was, I think, probably the biggest breakthrough that we had is once we actually discovered that we could see these injuries on MRI scans, that opened the ability to be able to study people who have an injury and people who don't have an injury. So, if you take a group of women who have prolapsed like I showed you before and you compare them to normal women, 
in normal women, 15% of those women have the kind of injury that I showed you, and it's 55% in the women who've had a vaginal, who have prolapse, not who've had vaginal delivery, I'm sorry. So these are women, the 151 women down at the bottom were women who had prolapse that we did MRIs on and compared them to a group of normal volunteers. So there's a 40% excess occurrence of muscle injury. So this is a major association with pelvic organ prolapse. Part of the problem was that they broke their muscles when they're in their 20s and 30s and early 40s and they have their prolapses later on and that's, as I said, one of the things that was difficult to be able to say what was related between birth. But by doing these kinds of studies, we were able to show that this was a, a greatly increased excess occurrence. So let's now start to talk a little bit about the process of a 34 uh, circumference object coming through a two and a half centimeter wide opening. So the students could easily figure out what degree of lengthening has to happen of an opening that's got a diameter of 2.7 centimeters that needs to reach a <coughs> circumference of 34 centimeters. And I would ask if anybody has an example of anything else in the body that has to stretch that much to raise their hand. I can't think of anything in the human body or in most of the rest of vertebrate zoology that has to undergo that degree of lengthening. And to think that 90% of the time it happens without injury is actually the remarkable part, that women are able to give birth and the vast majority of them do just fine with that. So we need to get to the injury mechanism. Um, there was a lot of discussion and the primary hypothesis in the field was that this was denervation. And there was some electromyographic evidence that there was changes in nerve function. So there are many people who said it's about nerve compression. Nerve compression and stretching is what causes pelvic floor injury. So that would lead you to do a certain number of things. There was also a group, uh, several groups that thought that it was muscle compression. It's the compression of the muscle against the bony pelvis that's the problem. There's also the muscle tearing hypothesis. So we had three different things to be able to work on. And because prevention depends upon knowing the cause, as you all know, for those of you that work with physicians, we're completely happy to accept theories that have no factual basis at all and just charge ahead with that. It was one of the cultural things that when we melded the engineering culture with the medical culture that the docs needed to learn was that if you had a belief, you actually had to explain to people why you believe that, which was a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to think about. Because if it's compression, the longer there's compression, the more the injury. There were many people who said that you needed to shorten the length of time that it took the baby to be born or you would have more injuries. So if it was over two hours of the mother pushing to try and get the baby out, you'd put forceps on to hasten the delivery. If it's tearing, that would probably be the exact wrong thing. So the question is, if we think that we should know what the mechanism is to be able to do prevention, how are we going to be able to tell? So one thing is we started doing simulations, and this is the first simulation that we did. Well, we actually did a whole bunch of simulations that didn't work and we threw out, as all of you know, but this is the first one that we were happy enough with to publish, which is completely a geometric simulation. It was just done in MATLAB and it was just looking at the lengths of the hoops. There was nothing dynamic about it. But we actually just assigned numbers to representative parts of the muscle uh, and I would call your attention to PC2, who is going to be the major protagonist in our story. And as you can see, as you sequentially bring um, a spherical object the size of a fetal head through to birth, you can see that there's a remarkable change that has to happen in the length of many of these different bands. And if you start to ask yourself which are the bands that have to lengthen the most, then you start to have some idea about a simple analytical scheme for us to be able to start to look at what's going on. So we took the resting length of each of these different muscle bands, looked at the length that they were at the full birth uh, position, and then calculated a stretch ratio. And you can see that PC2 is the band that actually has the greatest lengthening that has to happen. Now the problem with this is that 1.6 is the amount that a strided muscle can lengthen without injury. So the first problem is that you would basically predict that almost all of the muscle itself, except for a few 
fibers up here would be injured. And so that's part of what we haven't figured out yet is why is it, and some of it has to do with the viscoelastic properties of the connective tissue the muscle is embedded in that actually protects the muscle from that to some extent. So we wanted to check and see whether this was plausible. So this is an MRI of a woman, again, who has a one-sided defect. You can see that she's got a normal muscle over on this side beside the urethra, and it's missing over here. And we cut our model in half, and this is PC2. So the most stretched muscle is the muscle that's in the area that is injured. So at least we were starting to hone in on what it was that we thought was going on. So that gave us a hypothesis, but we didn't have a way to be able to check whether that idea was right or not. So we talked with Catherine Brandon, who's one of the wonderful musculoskeletal radiologists, about how we could do more to be able to study injury mechanisms, and we came up with the following uh, strategy. Um, and we took 19 women having their first birth, and we took women that from risk factors we knew were high risk for having injuries, because if the injury rate is 1 in 10, you're going to pay for 10 MRIs for every one person who's got an injury, which gets to be pretty expensive. So we said, well, let's pick the people with the big babies and the long labors and the ones who we know are at risk for having an injury. Then we scanned them early, about a month afterwards, and we scanned them late, which was about six months afterwards. We did what are called anatomical sequences, which is what I've been showing you, that's just let's get a look at the mechanism. And then we did what are called fluid sensitive scans because they show injury in intact muscles. And I'll, I'll talk with you as you look at a few of those to be able to see that a little bit better. So here was the basic idea that if there is direct muscle trauma, that if the muscle rips, it should be ripped right after the delivery and it should still be ripped uh, six months later. So if your hypothesis is that it's a tear, you should see it in the early scans and you should see it in the later scans. If you clip a nerve, or if somebody suffers a spinal cord injury, right afterwards their muscles look pretty normal, but six months later there'll be a nerve-related atrophy that happens. And with connective tissue, if it's compression that causes this, there'll be edema from the compression. And the fortunate thing is that there are two muscles that are both right inside the pelvic bones. One is the levator, which is our muscle of interest, and the other is the obturator internus muscle, which is a hip muscle that doesn't undergo stretching. And so if it's compression, both muscles should be involved. And if it's stretching, then it should only be the levator. Maybe if we can, I guess, can people see these OK? I think we can probably see them with the... So one of the two muscles is injured. And again, I'm giving you a unilateral so that you can see. And this is the early scan and the late scan. So if you look at the bullseye right in the middle, that's the urethra. And remember that you're going to look to the left side of the urethra and the right side of the urethra to see if you can see a muscle. So if we look here, we can see the urethra and the vagina, and we can see the muscle right over here. If we look on the other side, the vagina goes right out to the obturator internus muscle, and there's no muscle on that side. And what about six months later? Has it changed at all? Looks pretty much the same. Now, the one thing that you will notice, which is a subtlety, is if you look here, this muscle, which is the levator, is a little bit lighter than this muscle, which is the obturator internus. That's because there's edema in the muscle. And you can see over here, they're both the same color. They're both equal darkness because the edema has resolved at that point. So you can see that if you were going to press against the, the, the sides of the pelvis, you couldn't press this with something in the vagina without pressing on this as well. So these are the fluid sensitive scans. Now, this is the regular anatomical sequence over here. See, here's our little bullseye, and we've got a levator muscle on this side, and we've got a levator muscle on this side. So she's got intact muscles on both sides. There's a little bit of a ding on this one, but not much. Do you see how bright they are now over here on the fluid sensitive scan, how they're now white and white over here? And yet the obturator internus muscle is dark. So the compression idea that something's pressing on the muscle and causing compression isn't consistent with what we're seeing in terms of the fluid sensitive scans. 
So let's keep score now. So let's start thinking about our levator tear hypothesis. Six of these 19 women had tears that were early. Three of them were high grade, which means they lost more than 50% of the muscle. Not a single one resolved. Not a single one resolved. So if, you, if your hypothesis is that the muscle tears, there's support for that. Now the other uh, 16, uh, 13, I'm sorry, simply didn't have a tear. You know, we didn't know that they had tears. We just did MRIs. But let's take a look at compression. Every single levator had this high signal intensity, which is the, the fluid sensitive. That's the white that you saw. Every single individual did. It never involved the obturator internus. So if you stretch a muscle, it's going to get edematous. But if you compress a muscle, it's going to compress the obturator internus. So the stretch hypothesis is still alive, and the compression hypothesis is dead. Delayed atrophy, we never saw. That was the dominant idea in the field. That's what most people were saying, is that it was neuropathic change. And there are nerve changes in the levator after birth, but they're not responsible for the injury that's related to prolapse later on in life. So there is this stress-induced um, muscle origin, and I have uh, stress is always a difficult word for me. It's a difficult word for our group because to the nurses in the group, stress is psychosocial stress. To the gynecologists, it's stress urinary incontinence, which is incontinence when you cough and sneeze. And to the engineers, it's force per unit cross-sectional area, as I remember. So we always have a problem with stress. But how are we going to study that? Well, this is something that we've just published that uh, Tra um, Paige Tracy, one of our new PhD candidates, um, has just done, which is a capacity demand analysis. Because we need to move this into the clinic where we can talk to an individual woman about the data and how that's going to affect her choices about how she's going to give birth. Because we already know that the vast majority of people have a normal birth without any injury, but there are a few people that have something really bad happen to them. And so do you want to do C-sections on all the women that are going to have a perfectly normal birth without any injury? Of course not. But are you going to then just throw your hands up and tell these women that are being injured that they're just going to be injured? And if you're going to try and figure out how to predict it, all the predictors that we have like birth weight. How do you know how big the baby is going to be? How long do you know how the, long the second stage of labor is going to take? How do you know whether you're going to have to do forceps or not? Those are all things that we look back afterwards. So Paige and James and I decided to try and tackle this. And the basic idea is pretty simple. Um, uh, James and Paige came up with um, a ratio which is called G, uh, which is the maternal geometric circumference divided by the fetal head circumference. So it's the capacity of the pelvic floor to deliver a baby versus the demand, which is the size of a fetal head. So if you think that you have an opening and you have a small fetal head, then there's lots of capacity. If there's a big fetal head, there's less capacity for that demand. So the number G is going to, is going to be the capacity to demand ratio. So basically, what we did is to say, here are all of these loop-like things, and we're going to simplify that into a single loop, and we picked the loop that we know that's injured. And what Paige did is just a simple um, two-dimensional, actually, I guess, in essence, it's a one-dimensional mathematical analysis that looks at the different factors that could be influential in birth. So we've got this soft tissue loop here which starts inside the pubic bone. It's got to go around the fetal head and go back up to the pubic bone. And the fetal head has to fit under this arch of the pubic bones in order to get out. So we looked at, Paige made some models uh, of several different volunteers to be able to get the geometry of the resting lengths for the muscles. And there are basically two different muscles that we were looking at. One of them is the pubovisceral muscle, um, which starts up here high inside the pubic bones, wraps uh, down around the vagina and, and rectum here. And the other is called the puborectal muscle here, which starts down lower on the pubic bone and goes behind the rectum. Uh, if any of you have read the ultrasound literature, there's this unfortunate uh, confusion with terms is that some people use the term puborectal muscle for the muscle that's injured. Uh, that turns out not to be true, but at the time people picked the name, they didn't know that. But 
the injured muscle is the pubovisceral muscle, and the puborectal muscle is a different muscle from that. And I'm sorry for the confusion. And then we looked at how long they had to get in order to be able to get around the fetal head at crowning. So taking into account, we said that there's the 1.6 stretch ratio that a strided muscle can normally do without being injured. Factor that into the calculations in order to be able to predict who would be injured and who wouldn't be injured. So the puborectal loop starts at about um, uh, 42 centimeters uh, in loop length. And there are two different conditions with the pubovisceral muscle. One of them is whether you, and let me just go back, whether you decide that it only lengthens from here down or whether you consider that it lengthens from here down. And so we simply did two different simulations to cover those because we don't know which of those it is yet. And so these, as you can see, were quite a bit shorter. So already you can see that the puborectal muscle, which is the uninjured, mus uninjured muscle, has an advantage because it starts out longer. So there were going to be anatomical variations in the length of the muscles that would have to be taken into, into consequence. So we did a bunch of measurements of the geometry of the hiatus and then used the bell curve of that to be able to run simulations using a Monte Carlo strategy where we could say, you know, let's run the second percentile and the 50th percentile and the 20th percentile and those kinds of things. So that's one of the variables is initial limp, um, loop length. The next one is the angle of the pubic arch, that if you've got a really wide arch, the head sits up tightly up here, and you need a shorter loop to get around that than if you have a very narrow arch, and the head can't fit quite as high up in there, then the loop has to go farther in order to be able to get it around. So uh, what Page did is to you look at, again, a bell curve of different arch um, uh, angles, and that then would allow her to be able to calculate how far down all the different head sizes were. And then we looked at the points of origin and we said, how, where's, where's the highest place that the muscle could or originate from and where's the lowest? I won't comment on this slide because everybody would know very quickly that I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'll just leave it up here for a second to be able to give you some idea about the analysis strategy that Page used in terms of coming up with the geometry. And this is in the, the um, I think, last month's Journal of Biomechanics if you want to read the equations in detail. Now, so this is looking at the fact that the head is soft at birth. And so the head actually undergoes what's called molding, which means that it's compressed in this direction and it gets longer in this direction. And so the circumference gets a little bit smaller. So we had to take molding into account when we were dealing with the head dimensions. And so what Page did is to look at the different percentiles of head circumferences and then the different assumptions about the amount of molding. And that way she could calculate the head circumference in all of these different scenarios. So let's take a look at the pubovisceral muscle length. Now these are the calculations of G. And so remember if G is greater than one, you have lots of capacity and you're not going to predict injury. And if you have a G of less than one, then you violate the assumptions that are necessary for an injury-free birth and you would predict injury. And so she was able to show that everybody basically who has a maternal capacity uh, from the 25th percentile and greater is not going to have an injury. So that then allows you to identify 75% of the people just with measuring on ultrasound, which is really easy to do, the size of the levator loop. So 75% of people you can reassure in the beginning that no matter how big the baby that they're going to have is going to be, they're going to have an adequate uh, opening to be able to do that. And then you can start to see it layer out so that if you have um, a fetal head circumference that's in the 95th percentile and if you have somebody that's in the maternal size of a, um, she's basically way above what the, or way below what the injury threshold should be. 
Now for the puborectal muscle, you can see that virtually nobody gets to the point that the puborectal muscle is under enough stretch that there's not an adequate capacity. And this is consistent with the data that looks at those two muscles in MRI scan and has shown that the pubovisceral muscle is injured and the puborectal muscle actually isn't injured. So then Page looked at which of the different parameters were the most influential in showing um, increased injury rates. And so soft tissue loop length, whether you looked at the puborectal muscle, the pubovisceral muscle without wrapping, or the pubovisceral muscle with wrapping, had a very big influence on the injury rate. So that, so that a 10% change in soft tissue loop length actually resulted in a 15% change in injury. The non-contact length, how far it went up above the head, actually had a relatively modest change. And subpubic arch was quite a bit less. And the origin um, separation, just looking at where they were side to side that I didn't explain, basically didn't have much of an influence at all. So this is kind of where we're at right now. The idea is that now we've got some measurements that we can make in women that fit with this overall tear paradigm that then gives us an ability to start to say, OK, could we then start to move back into the clinical arena? Um, ultrasound is safe for the fetus and safe for the mother. The ultrasounds now are very good at being able to get the geometry of the levator ani muscles. Uh, it takes about 45 seconds to be able to get that. The analysis will probably take about another minute. The fetal head geometry is easy to get at about 36 or 37 weeks, and the predicted growth is really pretty accurate. But what you'd like to have is the head size when a woman gets into labor and the head goes down into the pelvis. So we're kind of working on that right now. But that's where we are with the capacity demand ratio. So the numerical value of capacity demand, G, indicates a theoretical risk of of pubovisceral injury, and obviously you all know that we have a lot of testing to do before we can go prime time with this. This is just kind of the conceptual development. Maternal capacity is, is most influenced by this initial soft tissue length, followed by the non-contact length, that amount that's above the head, the subpubic arch angle, and the levator origin. And that um, 75%, we can predict of 75% of women, we can take out of the injury risk uh, group and say and reassure them that they have uh, likelihood of having a normal delivery. So it's then logical in those 25% then to go on and measure the fetal head um, and be able to then put that into equation because if there's a small mom with a small baby and a small opening, that's probably going to be okay. So what's needed? There are a lot of things and if I think about our full laundry list of the things that are needed to be able to bring this kind of mechanical analysis even close to where the knee is. I mean, there are, and we actually looked it up how many articles there are on knee mechanics. It's like 5,000 articles on knee mechanics. And there are, what do you think, Jen, maybe 10 or 20 about the pelvic floor. And yet the injury rate is 10%. So there's this huge need for people to start to address this problem from a mechanic standpoint. Now, one of the biggest things that we need, and one of the things is, uh, oh, so identifying women at risk, we've talked about that. Is there another tissue in the body whose viscoelastic properties are more remarkable than the vaginal canal? When you think about taking an opening that's that big in over two hours, hour and a half, sometimes 45 minutes, and having that go to that. Some total of the articles that have been studied on the human viscoelastic properties of the pelvic floor, zero. Zero. So a huge area of, of future research. And you know, part of the thing is, how on earth are we going to do that? So we're working on that. Um, and then more detail about the injury mechanism. And I think a lot of it's going to have to do with the viscoelastic properties because it's, you know, the, the time constants are such that, that there's a lot of stress relaxation that happens that, that people who do births know about. And they say, kind of hold the head down there for a while. Give it a little bit more time. Let the tissue 
kind of ease itself out a little bit. And even though not a single one of those people knows the word viscoelasticity, that's actually a very important part about what's going on. And so I think that there's going to be a lot about rates of stress because forceps, which are used to pull the baby's head out, have an odds ratio of 15 for levator injuries. And a vacuum, which pulls the head out, has no increased risk. Why on earth? You know, part of it is that you just can't pull as hard on a vacuum. So there are a lot of things that have to do with fiscal elasticity and the injury mechanism that I think are going to be done. Because we already know how to intervene in the uterine cervix and how to make it more viscoelastic with chemicals, with prostaglandins. So it seems logical that we might be able to come up with ways to be able to do that. And I think that the, the first thing that will probably become prime time is being able to actually risk stratify women beforehand and start to say, you've got a really big baby, you've got a really small opening, you're only, you know, and the woman says, really, you know, my partner and I are only thinking about having one baby. You know, then we could say, do you want to think about having a C-section? That's a perfectly rational thing. Um, or does the woman say, you know, I'd like to try. And it's not going to hurt the baby. And if she really knows what the risks are, then, you know, certainly all of us that play sports go out and do things that we know we could be injured. So I think that, that that's going to be one of the things. And then alternatives to forceps are needed. And I think that's probably going to be a way to, to do force limiting. Well, I again wanted to just acknowledge the tremendous work that, that uh, everybody in the team has been doing with this. Uh, I also really appreciate how, how generous our government has been in, in being kind enough to be able to fund this research because it takes a lot of people that are just sitting in conference rooms talking. It takes a lot of people sitting in conference rooms talking and getting rid of bad ideas that we thought were good ideas. Um, and that's been one of the most important things about the dialogue is I kind of come up with something and you know, James and, and, and Lu Yan and Jia Jia just say, no, John. You know, the things like, you know, I used to say, this is, you know, this is the direction of the, the pressure. And they'd say, no, John. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that a lot of this is, is it comes from dialogue of, of two groups together. And I think that if a structure fails, does anyone care? Well, engineers care if a bridge falls. If a bridge falls, how many engineers do you think are going to be working on that bridge failure to make sure that that bridge never falls again? And I think that's the exciting part of this, is that engineers now are involved in the dialogue and bring the kind of conversation to failure analysis that's the kind of thing that's going to bring, bring answers to us in the future. Well, that's kind of my little rant on, um, on pelvic floor injury, and I'd be very interested in questions that people have. Thank you. Thank you. Questions that people have? Yes. This is a great <coughs> question, really. And uh, second birth is always easy. Or, mm -hmm. me. Yep. Uh, this is preconditioning. I mean, it, it, what, what's your what's your interpretation of that? Yeah. Change. It's yeah. Simply that the the system actually is now adjusted. It, that's exactly the level that we know. <laughs> right. There's something that happens, and, and that's the part that we're starting to move into, is that the muscle injury was kind of the easiest thing to see, because it's pretty obvious once you develop an eye for it. There's a lot of kind of what Peter Dietz refers to as microtrauma um, that is non-levator related. That means that the opening is just bigger uh, after the first birth. Not overtly, but subtly in a way because this is a threshold phenomenon that as long as you're below the threshold, you're fine. And so just a small change puts a lot of people above the threshold. And so the second birth, there are things have, you know, the loop links are a little bit longer, the connective tissue has a little bit more length to it. So the second baby comes out probably, I would estimate, three times easier. You know, it's just kind of a crude. And that's something we're studying. The one thing that we're currently working on is that, peop that unless there's 50% of the muscle that's injured, it has no association with prolapse. You have to get to half the muscle before the remaining muscle can't recover enough to be able to compensate. But we've looked at four women who had a small injury after their first birth, looked at them after their second birth, and three out of the four went from a partial injury to a full injury. So they went from not, not being in a risk group. So that's something that we're thinking about. But it is you know, one of the things that I'm hoping that five years from now we know a little bit more and I have a better answer. But there, you know, and this is the hand-waving clinician part of me. Oh, things change a little bit and it's OK and that kind of thing, which is the way of saying that we really don't know. It's not just clinicians that wave their hands. Yes, that's right. That's right.
Yes. A couple of times during your talk, you referred to um, either skeletal muscle or uh, striated muscle. Yeah. Uh, I had the preconception that the muscles you were speaking about were what I would classify as smooth muscles. No. They're voluntary muscles. You can, you can lift your, your bottom up off the chair with contracting those muscles. They are voluntary. They have, like the anal sphincter, they have an automatic um, control system. Um, so um, your anal sphincter is firing constantly. And if you're in an elevator and think that you're going to have passed gas, you can activate it even more. <laughs> but I used to be. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's for another talk. <laughs> um, but the actual, stri these are, are funny striated muscles uh, because they had this automatic activity. And during defecation, during the second stage of labor, there's this profound relaxation that's not willfully controlled, that we don't, you know, when I put the nerves up at the beginning, that's one of the things that we probably have the least uh, information about. Paul Hodges, who's in Melbourne? I think Paul's an Australian. Pardon? Canberra. Canberra. Uh, I think his background is in uh, physiatry, which is called physiatry there. We call it PMNR, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And he's been doing some motor control experiments um, to try and look at it. And there are autonomic-like activities to it. But if you put it under a microscope, it's strided muscle. There may be some parts of it that are kind of like cardiac muscle that have striations, but it's, it's primarily a strided muscle. It came from the tail waggers and quadrupeds. It just kind of folded under as we, as we got an upright posture. Yes? Um, I have a question. Um, maybe I miss it. Did you come up with a different stiffness for the muscle? Uh, or did you assume the same stiffness? Right, very, very perceptive. These are that stiffness of a muscle can change in milliseconds, depending upon its neural activity. And we're way far away from that yet. Um, that basically, you know, what we're looking at is a relaxed stress on a muscle so that it rips. And so we've, we've done some things with active simulations. We've got some two-dimensional models uh, that we've done where we look at it to just kind of simplify it when we were looking at how women push during labor and how that can impact birth. But it's actually a very important thing because some women are kind of tight because of pain during the second stage and there's a lot more resistance when the muscles are activated. If you give somebody a spinal anesthetic or an epidural a fair amount, you can paralyze the muscles and have them relax and that would, that would be very much important. A really good question. There's another question over here. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, so you're, you focused on the, the geometric Changes, mm -hmm. you know, the kinematics of uh, of childbirth, and you mentioned also earlier on that we don't know much about the mechanical behaviour of the tissues involved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, clearly the mechanical behaviour or properties of the tissue, mm -hmm. the nonlinearity yep. and the viscoelasticity, are uh, important if you're, yep. you know, wanting to measure or predict the forces involved. Yeah. But do you think that they uh, that knowledge is important? from the point of view of your prediction yeah. of damage, yeah. which is, this, yep. I mean, from your indication, yeah. here is a kinematic. It's absolutely essential. Um, and what we have is some experimental animal data that we got from, from rats, where we did you know, standard ramp and hold uh, experiments on rat tissue. And we had a couple of primate specimens that we were able to do as well. And so, you know, the difficulty with research like this where there's so little known is that there's sometimes that you just kind of put a Band-Aid on a problem and say, we'll come up with a first order of approximation that we know isn't what we need to get to, to be able to kind of build an overall analytical structure. And then viscoelasticity and getting some actual, um, you know, we're looking at doing microindentation things on biopsies now to be able to get some small specimens and either be able to do micromechanical pull or micromechanical indentation to be able to start to get some idea of in women in the last weeks right before they deliver, can we get a piece of tissue that would actually be, allow us to get some of the mechanical properties? Um, because it is, 
you know, and I'm not worried about it as much as James is because he knows that it, it, it's fundamental to all of our calculations is what those assumptions are. And so, so we've had a lot of discussions. We've gotten the best that we can do, and we kind of keep our eye on that area. And hopefully, either we or some other groups will get, you know, get a way to be able to actually look at that. It's remarkable. I took out, I didn't know how, how graphic people wanted to get about birth. I took the actual videos of birth out, but because we realized with some of the undergraduate students that we work with, you know, an 18-year-old engineering student seeing a human birth for the first time, there was usually a long time of sober reflection afterwards, so. <laughs> so, but yeah, a really good, a really good point. <laughs> yes? So I was just wondering, uh, after birth, is, there, is the head size measured? Is that routine? Is that it's, the, routine. Yeah, it's routine. But oh, it's... Yeah, that information is really easy, but what it is when it's compressed in the birth canal is the problem, the molding. And one of the things that people do is after the head comes out, they measure it going back to its original shape over time. So it's kind of a reverse engineering way of looking at it is that, that you know, they can kind of take the curve back and estimate how much molding. There's some data from the 1920s where they actually took stillborn infants and, and wrap towels around their heads to see how much molding was. And then it, that was a period of time that we were taking, actually routinely taking x-rays during labor. Uh, and they could look at the overlapping of the fetal skull bones in order to, so it's, that's the, the way that we were able to try and estimate what it is. But the actual measurement right afterwards is taken routinely on every baby. Yes? Um, sir, does it happen to other species too? Or is yeah. it just for humans that they've got no, the, the squirrel monkey, for example, has bigger babies to maternal size than humans do. Um, and they have, they develop prolapse and they have some of the injuries. The problem is that they're a tailed monkey and so they don't have levators. Um, it's, a, it's a different muscular structure in, in quadrupedal animals. And once you get to, to gorillas and orangutans, which have a more human-like pelvis, it's actually easier to work with humans. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, and, you know, if there happened to be a gorilla that died in labor, I'd fly anywhere in the world to try and get some tissue to be able to do it. But, um, but yeah, there are other species. I mean, when you think about a chicken and an egg, um, you know, the egg is probably bigger proportionally to the size of the of the hen. So it does happen in um, in other species. Um, information from other species, or do you think that we need information from humans? Yeah. Which is why I was asking. Yeah. Is it happening? Is yeah. It the same? So the, the human geometry is very unique, um, that, you know, we stand upright. Um, and our pelvic floor is at the bottom of our abdominal pelvic cavity. And we don't have tails. And the whole levator mechanism is really. I mean, even chimpanzees' pelvic floors are very different than humans, and so the geometry and everything needs to be human geometry. And we really don't know much about the viscoelastic properties of, of experimental animals. We have uh, done rats, as I said, and the way that they know that a guinea pig's gonna deliver the next day is that you can put a finger, the, the pelvis enlarges enough that you can get a finger into it. And so there is that kind of connective tissue change. So I think it's gonna be a combination of you know, always kind of keeping our eye on the human material properties, but we're probably going to have to get some of it from other animals. Question over here on the end. So, so it seems to me one of the big challenges with working in this field is really getting the longitudinal data. Yeah. You know, you, you're dealing with an event that, like you say, is, is happening in your 20s or 30s or 40s, early 40s, and then sort of danger, uh, damage or, or, I guess, um, symptomatic damage. At least yeah. So is there any kind of movement in this field to try and establish some sort of national or global kind of registry? You've got 3D images, yeah. you've got all of the symptomatic stuff. Because well, you're really predictive, you need yeah. large numbers. You're, we're dealing with kind of small numbers. There, there's a lot that's been done in Scandinavia that has you know, uniform health records starting in 1960, so that questions like how much does vaginal birth increase a woman's likelihood of having pelvic floor disorders and those kinds of things. The difficulty is that our ideas are changing so rapidly that 
doing the kind of longitudinal. So what we're doing now is case control studies where you know, basically we take people with disease and people without disease that we can get in their you know, 50s and 60s and 70s and kind of work that out and then work on the other end. Uh, funding agencies, I don't think we'll ever fund this kind of thing for that long. Um, just because, you know, obviously they have to have a higher priority on cardiovascular, you know, and stroke and those kinds of things than, than the others. But it's, um, but it's absolutely the thing that we all need to be creative and say, other than doing a study where you wait for 30 years, what's the other way? Don Wilson, who was in Otago, um, actually had a cohort that he followed for about 20 years. Yeah, 20 years now. Um, but 20 years ago, what we were, the questions that we were asking were very different. Yeah. Measurements. Measurements are not Right. Any more last question? Yeah. Yes. I'm just wondering about the pelvic floor muscle exercise that now the new mothers have been told to actually do it you know, during their pregnancy. So right. What do you think of that? Do you think that could um, maybe potentially prevent a prolapse? It doesn't. <laughs> um, so, so pelvic muscle, well, pelvic muscle exercise during pregnancy as a preventative doesn't prevent injury. Uh, Carolyn Samsell, who is a nurse researcher at our institution, did a randomized trial. So during, um, during pregnancy, I don't think that it really would influence injury rates. Once somebody is injured, one of the questions is, if you have a torn muscle, should you be exercising it before the scar tissue is formed? And if there are people who are symptomatic, of course we would treat them with pelvic muscle training. So the question in my mind is for the people who aren't injured and who are not symptomatic, is it worth them spending time on pelvic muscle training? Because, pardon? Yes. <laughs> and, and I will, uh, and there are many people who believe that. And, but I guess the alternative thing that I would say is, if you have 100 women, you have them all in pelvic muscle training, and 20 of them are symptomatic and they get better, it's a lot of work to treat the 80 people that aren't, you know, that aren't really at risk. Is it better to really focus on identifying the people at risk and identifying things and getting them into intensive therapy and then taking the people who've had an easy birth and you know, the pelvic floor recovery is so great that there is a three month earlier recovery with pelvic floor exercises. Carolyn was able to look at that with looking at muscle strength. So there's clearly a resumption of normal strength earlier. And I guess the question then is effort. Is since the outcome is gonna be the same at that point in time, and I realize that I'm an outlier in this, and I, I'm, I'm perfectly <laughs> okay. happy to be the provocateur, but I think that there's a very important role for pelvic floor rehabilitation. And none of us, for somebody who's injured, would deny somebody you know, the benefits of having trained physical therapy and those kinds of things. I guess in my own mind, we still have to prove that for the other people, there's benefit to it. You know, for the uninjured people is, because Kari Bo's regimen is what, 45 minutes, three times a week? <laughs> 45 minutes, I've been through one of her workouts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it takes, a, it takes a while, but thanks for bringing that up because there is a very important and real role. Exactly who the people are, I think there's still room for people to, to get some good work done, but it's something that there will be answers to hopefully pretty soon. Okay, so I think we'll wrap it up there now. Thank you so Great. much for oh, coming. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah. It's been very informative. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much.